Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are at a really cool park that I have never been to. We're at Joshua Tree National Park here in California and I can't wait. I've been wanting to come here for quite some time. This park is known for some really unique things and we're about to go in and explore and you're coming with me. Let's go. I'm very excited to finally make it out here. I have passed through this region so many times without stopping and I keep seeing my friends photos popping up with all the cool things that there are here and I just I had to. I was too close not to so you're coming with me and we're gonna go explore. If you've been here before leave a comment with your favorite thing that you did because I know I'm not gonna be able to do everything today but I'm gonna try to do a few little things. So uh, let's see where this goes. Guys, I'm so excited. We found our first sign. We found our first sign, and uh, because the van's running, we're gonna just roll down the window so we don't lock ourselves out, because cell signal, not so great through here. <laughs> And this sign right here talks to us about the Colorado Desert. It's a subregion of the Sonoran Desert. This is cool. So we are considered to be in the desert, but one of the things that makes Joshua Tree so neat is the fact that it's known for large boulders, massive boulders everywhere. And from this area, I think you can see why. These mountains in front of us are not like the mountains that we've seen in other places. They're very, very different. So this is gonna make for a very fun adventure of checking out some of the nature here. Okay, a couple of other things that I learned is this is actually considered to be low desert as opposed to high desert. But despite being low desert, it actually has a hotter temperature than the neighboring Mojave. Wow, I never knew that. So this is, this is kind of interesting right here. Just right from the start, cool facts. And if you can't tell, I'm already geeking out. Let's go. tell you the past couple of days I have actually physically been sitting outside this park just waiting for a day that I could go and explore. We were actually in a wind advisory for two full days and winds gust up to 30 to 40 miles per hour and it was pretty insane and my whole van was just shaking but I wasn't going to give up the dream of coming here. I was not going to do it. I was right there so I would just stuck it out for a couple more days and here we are. Today is not perfect by any means. It's still kind of chilly, kind of windy, but at the same time, way better than the last couple of days. I found it, I found it. I am really excited. There's like a full on visitor center, lots of parking, and this is called the Cottonwood area. So here we go. Okay, we went into the visitor center, we paid our entrance fee, AKA we showed our park pass. We got a couple of patches for the van and a map, and now we're off. So now it's time to put the little pieces of Velcro onto the patches. This has gotten a little bit out of hand. I'll have to deal with this at a later time, but for now we're just gonna put those on and then we'll add them up here. Okay, and I guess we'll start out here. And then let's go up with the second one, which is our official Joshua Tree one. And the reason why I got two here was because I wanted to commemorate the sandstorm in a really cool way. And this is, this is from that. This was two days sitting outside of the park. As always, I pick up a map and the map has such wonderful information. And I also talked to a ranger and a ranger told me that I need to go straight down this road that's next to the visitor center to an oasis, like a real legitimate oasis. So I can't wait. We're about to do that. It is called the Cottonwood Oasis and uh, this is going to be super fun. But inside of the map itself, it tells a little bit more about the oasis here and how that they have several different ones throughout the park. And then on the inside, of course, is the 
regular map, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, if you're familiar with cartoons at all, you've probably seen an oasis or two in the form of a mirage. In fact, cartoons have drawn reference from real life oasises like these oases. What, what would be the proper word here? Oasises, oases. But uh, they have drawn inspiration from them for years, but usually they use them in the form of a pop-up as a fictitious thing. However, in real life, they do exist and we're about to go and see one. Now that we're at the Turkey Flats area, I wanted to take a moment to look a little deeper into our map. Again, the reason why you get this is because of all the cool information. Inside the visitor center, we saw that they actually are known for the desert tortoise. But here it talks a little bit more about all of the different wildlife. And the interesting thing about Joshua Tree is it actually splits its space between the Mojave Desert and the Colorado Desert. So where we came in at the entrance at Cottonwood was actually the Colorado Desert, but the further north that we go up, the closer to the Mojave Desert that we could become. And here you can find all sorts of different critters. And do you see it? Do you see it? It's a black-tailed jackrabbit. Interestingly enough, I have a black-tailed jackrabbit. Now, a lot of you probably have noticed this whenever I've done some of my driving shots before, but I have this little bunny. It's a little bunny finger puppet, and it took me for the greater portion of two, almost three years to find this guy. A lot of places have the different critters, but they never have the bunny. But this guy is in fact a black-tailed jackrabbit. Ah! So yeah, um, I have a black-tailed jackrabbit in my car. It's only fitting and it's super cute, but um, it's nice to know that these things are in fact native to the Mojave Desert where we're at right now. So that's kind of fun. And isn't he cute? Oh yeah, he's super, super cute. Other unique critters that we might find are kit foxes, zebra-tailed lizards, kangaroo rats, and then here's some of the vegetation also labeled. But then up here we have like the desert spiny lizard, the yucca night lizard, the desert wood rat, just all sorts of different things. And then on the side, it goes into a little bit of the transitional zone, which has a lot of different kinds of critters also. So by getting the map, you kind of know what you're looking for. You can learn a little bit more about the habitats that they would be in. And also when you're looking out into the vastness of the desert, you could say, ooh, I bet a bunny lives there. Arriving at Cottonwood Springs, there's a quote here that says, in a few minutes we were at Cottonwood Spring, among shady trees and with excellent water in abundance. Now we see here that the map actually shows us the entirety of the trail, and this is the Cottonwood Spring Trail. So you can go on a pretty decent little trek if you want to, and overall see in about three miles some pretty amazing things. In fact, in this area, if you continue following, you can find where the oldest dated people of the park actually lived. In addition, there are some mines along this area also, and of course the oasis, but that's what we're gonna go check out first, and then uh, we'll play it by ear. We have a lot of park to see and not much time to do it, so let's go check out a really cool oasis. Just to give a point of reference, I am 5'7". These extend at least, at, at least, probably 10 of me tall. At, at least. It's insane. They are super tall.
Now at the beginning of the trail, we read the quote where they actually happened upon this place and what kind of they thought about it. However, the Native Americans have actually been living in this area for quite some time. In fact, they would consider an area like this kind of like a supermarket because since it had the ability for things to grow so freely and so vast, it allowed them a variety of different kinds of things that they could source from an area like this. So coming here, we're seeing something super cool, but we're also seeing something that would be super valuable to the people who originally inhabited this area. Now again, there's a 3.4 mile trail that actually leaves out of this area just beyond the oasis. And it looks kind of like this. Along this route is where you'll find the native peoples, where they used to live, the earliest signs of human occupation, and then also a mine. So that's kind of cool. So I know whenever I came out to Joshua Tree, that was not what I was expecting. The oasis definitely blew my mind and it was less than 0.1 miles. Just showing that you can come to a national park and be able to get to things without having to walk a million miles to get to the cool stuff. But let's have one last look at the vegetation. Not only in this area do we find mesquite, but we also find palm trees and actual cottonwoods. Guess what guys, we have another stop along the way and this one says a desert wash. So this is talking about all of the different washes and what they actually do kind of in the overall big picture of where we are. It's kind of fascinating because I have hiked a lot of washes and at the same time been very nervous of being in some washes at some points in time. But let's see what they have to say. You'll notice on this sign there is a picture up in this corner over here. That is a smoke tree. And it says that the smoke tree actually depends on the flash floods in order to germinate their seeds. Now, whenever we look out beyond that though, you'll notice there are a lot of smoke trees out here just waiting for some moisture. And in the desert, that doesn't happen very often. But when it does, oh boy, it does. In fact, it's illustrated right here what this wash actually looks like. You can see that the road actually goes through right here, and then all of this area through here that looks a little bit different, that's where all of the rain would end up pushing to and kind of moving through. So currently we are standing in a wash. I have done a lot of hiking in some washes. However, I would never want to be on the receiving end of one of those flash floods. If you've never seen one, go and check out Flash Flood at Zion. That happened in the washes and was terrifying. Oh, we found another stop. We found another stop. And this one actually is marked with a very interesting sign that says four wheel drive only. Yeah, we're probably not gonna go down that one in dimples here, but right here, you see it? Let's go. In fact, here, this is where it splits off to Old Dale Road and Black Eagle Road. And it says very clearly that this is not maintained for regular drivers, four wheel drive only. But if we're wanting to find out a little bit more about it, this is a sign that explains what Old Dale and Black Eagle Mine Roads actually are and what you can expect to find. In fact, right here, it shows the entirety of the road as well as many of the little mines along the way that you can discover if you go down this road. So for all my four wheel drive friends out there, definitely check this one out. It's pretty awesome. You can see there are tons of little dots here. Everything from the OK mine to the Brooklyn mine, the cactus mine down here. There's probably at least 20 different stops. And it does go on to explain the different sections of the road and the difficulty also. Some of them say if you are not an experienced driver in your four wheel drive, don't even attempt because it is bad. So there's that, but that's kind of cool. This guy right here is thinking about it. He's thinking about it. He looks like he could make it. I bet he could. Now he's going toward Black Eagle Road. Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Hmm, maybe. Oh. He committed, he's going, and he is going without pause. Awesome. 
You know, sometimes whenever I look at my van, I think, wow, it'd be cool to have four wheel drive so I could go do stuff like that. Then again, I think of everything that I keep in my van just tossing back and forth, back and forth on those bumpy roads. And I think, mm, no, I'm good. I'm good. We'll just keep with my good fuel economy. <laughs> Anyway, on to the next we go and let's see what adventure we can find just down the road a bit more. We're now heading down toward 29 Palms. Another stop, another sign, and this time it looks like we're going to learn about some of the people who were originally in this area. Let's find out what the Pinto People sign has to say. What we are looking at here is actually the Pinto Basin, and at one point in time, it was said that there was an ancient river that ran through this area. Kind of hard to see that now with all the desert, but at one point in time, this did actually exist. And it was along this river that they actually found nearly six miles of camps containing culture from different kinds of sources that they had never seen before. In fact, they think that approximately 9,000 people once actually were in this area, and they found the remains of their villages in addition to fossils of llamas, horses, chickens, all sorts of different animals which would have been put into place to help the overall culture survive. And that is crazy, and it was right here. And that's why it pays to read the signs, guys. I know a lot of times when we come to places, especially in the desert, it takes a little bit of imagination to kind of envision what might have been. However, when you start learning about the details of what they have found here, that's when the desert goes from this cool place to this wild place that has so many neat stories. And that's why I come to places like this. There's a lot of beauty that can be found in the desert also. We'll see that though whenever we get up to the cactus area in just a few minutes but um yeah that was kind of a cool sign let's get back on the road on this sign we actually learn about alluvial fans and if that sounds familiar from watching my Rocky Mountain National Park video we actually get a good definition as to what exactly constitutes an alluvial fan here in the desert and it says here and gives you an illustration that they're actually broad fan-shaped piles of sediment that deposit at the mouth of the canyons so Despite the fact that this is obviously the desert, it has some similarities, in fact, to the Rocky Mountains, which are a lush, vibrant space that is completely different. It also says that despite this being called Turkey Flat, it's not really flat at all. It's actually sediments that have come down and created just like this constant movement of things in the alluvial fan. <laughs> we also have a couple of other things on this sign over here. Let's check those out. This sign goes along with what we were talking about in the van. It actually breaks down three very distinct zones, including the desert scrub, the sand dune, and the mountain area. And with this, you can see what kind of critters might inhabit that. Now there's kind of a cool thing about the Turkey Flat area. You probably noticed I said sand dunes, yet we look out and we don't really see any dunes. However, I talked to a ranger and he said that if you were to leave this point right here and hike in about three miles, there are actual physical sand dunes, like actual dunes <laughs> right out here. We just can't see them because of the distance they are away from us, but they are in fact here. That's wild. It's not just this rocky sediment. You can also find physical sand. Now it's probably not like the sand that we've played on at other places, so we're not gonna do that three mile hike. Instead, we're gonna keep it moving and find out what else we can discover. Okay, this next stop, guys, is super cool because it is actually the cacti area or the cactus area. And these are the Choya cactuses, which as the sun hits them, they turn this like golden color on the top and they are just spectacular to see. And they're all concentrated kind of in this area. Now, a couple things. We're not gonna touch these whatsoever because they hurt very badly. In fact, only one little critter doesn't have an issue with it and that is a specific type of wren. So I'm gonna take a walk, show you guys what we're looking at and uh, be very careful along the way.
things are amazing and some of them are taller than me. I'm really fascinated though because they have like a little bud on the end. I kind of want to figure out that a little bit more. So I'm going to have to definitely do some Google fingers whenever I get back to the van, but super, super cool. See what I'm talking about? The little end there. That's pretty fascinating. And it's not on all of them, but it's on a lot of them. That was pretty spectacular and I have to say this is the only place that I've ever seen this concentration of this specific kind of cactus. Now I've seen it at a couple of different display areas so you can kind of know what it is but never in like its natural form just like with all its little cactus buddies. Which brings me to my next question. Is it cacti or cactuses when it's plural? Leave in the comments below what you think it is. It's always been an ongoing debate here on the channel so it's a fun conversation to have and I'd like to hear what you guys think. But yeah, this place definitely is a must stop at Joshua Tree, to say the least. It is so spectacular and it looks completely different from anything that we've seen coming from the south side so far. So wow, yes. Let's see what else is up the road a little bit more as we get deeper into the park. I'm really, really starting to get super amped up and it's good that I'm getting amped up because I'm going to need that adrenaline to keep me warm. The temperatures are starting to drop and it's getting cold. Oh, it's getting cold, but um, no complaining here. Let's just keep it moving. Okay, guys, we found another stop and it was just a little bit past the cacti area or the cactus area. And this one looks very promising. We have a big mountain in front of us. We have some beautiful flowers and another sign. So let's go check out the sign. It says here we can check out the remains of the Silver Bell Mine and they are on the south side slopes. So somewhere up in this region over here probably, it looks as though there are a few distinct patterns for driving and then right there it looks like is where the actual mine is. It says that the pieces that we can physically see from here looking up are actually called tipples. Those tipples were what were used to store different things and feed them into the stamp battery. And so it kind of goes along with some of the other places that we've been before when it comes to mining, but this is our first mining stop on this trip, at least through Joshua Tree. And it's kind of fascinating. They say that the shafts are actually very unstable, so it's not open, so you can't go in there, but we can physically see from here where the mines used to be and this is not the only one as we saw in the four-wheel drive area there's tons of different mines in this area and um, all of them are probably not safe just the same so they're probably barred off with steel bars just looking at other places that we've been that's kind of the case so uh, let's see if we can get a little bit better view the Sun is very strong right now so I don't know but we're gonna try can you see it right as that little peak comes down? The peak on the right there. As it comes down, there are two small bin areas. Or they're pretty big, but they're small from here at least. Up close, this is what those bins would actually look like. And it says here that they operated the mine for some 40 years, but it was considered to be a versatile mine. It actually had gold, then lead, and then copper all the way up into the 50s. And since we can't get up close, they give us a nice illustration here so we could see what the function would have been like. And you can see there are two tipples, the second tipple there in front of us. And then it also has something called a skip and a grizzly. Now, like all sites that are protected by the government, we cannot pick up artifacts. If we do find something, we're supposed to report it so that they can actually come out here and excavate it properly. So as we're looking around, we can look, but we cannot touch. Remember that guys. But this is actually kind of a cool area because you can see what it would have been like to have to get up to the mine. Very steep, very rocky, not very friendly. I 
I will say this though, that mine lasted far longer than a lot of the mines have out here. In fact, that one showed reports all the way up into the 60s. So well after many of them had already petered out. And the reason why they credit that to being a possibility was because it was so versatile. They weren't just being able to find gold or silver, they actually were able to source a lot of different things from that mine, which kept it kind of in function. So that's kind of cool. And it's kind of like everything else here in the desert. You have to be able to adapt to survive. Okay, at our next stop, we find where the two deserts actually physically meet. So the Mojave and the Colorado. So I guess this would kind of be like a state line if you were a desert, I guess. But there's actually a sign here explaining a little bit more and uh, possibly what we can expect to see now that we're kind of making that transition over. So here's the physical map, the Colorado Desert, the Mojave Desert, and then the Great Basin Desert is up at the top. It says that the Colorado is actually a subdivision that extends west of the Colorado River and into the Coachella Valley. And then it goes all the way down to Baja. The Mojave Desert stretches the mountains that flank Los Angeles and through Southern Nevada. So we are going to see pieces of different parts of this as we kind of travel on some of our future adventures also. But really, really cool. And there's an illustration on the sign that shows you the difference between the vegetation where you see yuccas and Joshua trees versus more of the creosote brush and things like that. So that's kind of cool. I hope you guys can see from the signs and why we're stopping the full story of Joshua Tree here. It's not just the story of one national park, it's the story of one very unique national park that has a lot of moving parts and pieces that construct its physical bounds and borders. And so you are physically stepping foot into two very differing versions of a desert, which a lot of us only think of desert as one thing, but this just goes to show that a desert can be many things. And today we're getting some more of those little brain wrinkles as to what exactly that entails. Now going forward, we'll be in the Mojave Desert. So let's see if it looks any different, what kind of things that we can discover and the heart of Joshua Tree, where the vast majority of the action takes place. It says here that these are actually granite rocks and they burst through the crust of the earth millions of years ago. And now what we're seeing exposed is actually part of their geological story. So naturally that means we're gonna go explore and play a little bit. Um, I have on tennis shoes. We're gonna hope this goes well. see how this goes okay it's pretty chilly once we get out of the sun but yeah we're physically standing under a big rock let's just hope it doesn't decide to fall oh wow this is cool this is super cool I'm definitely gonna have to come back here with friends sometime so we can just like geek out a little bit oh my gosh this is awesome yeah, this is, this is another stop that you have to make. And this is just a little pull off. It's not that in depth. You can literally get there within like three seconds of the parking lot. Yeah, super cool, Joshua Tree.
It looks like there's a little path here, so we're gonna see how far it goes. I think it stops like right here, but it may not. So if it keeps going, we'll keep going. Um, yeah, it just kind of dead ends here. Okay, but there's so many of these little paths that you could literally spend an hour just going through the tiny paths here like, like this one. Or it takes you even further out to another set of boulders way out there. And that one looks so cool too. Oh my gosh, this is just, this just brought me to life. Seeing all of this, getting out here, and even though it is freezing, <laughs> it is well worth it to come out and explore this. I mean like, wow, <laughs> it's amazing. I'm gonna show you a little bit more as we walk around, but wow. And the only negative to an overview video like this of showing you kind of what all is here is that I don't get to physically take on each individual hike, but I will, I will one day, I will be back because there are so many neat things to explore out here. And I definitely want to bring like a friend with me because I think that that would just make it all the more fun. But back on the road we go to check out a couple more stops. And just for a little reference before we do, this is Skull Rock. So we have only made it into this portion right here of the upper part of the park. Now there are a few things that we won't be able to do today just based on the time of day that we're here and also that we didn't make arrangements. The Keys Ranch, you can actually take a tour of that, but it's only accessible through that tour. So we definitely won't be able to do that. Also, there are a couple of other spots on here that I've noticed that are four wheel drive only, so we won't be able to do those either. But we're going to try to get through a few more of these before we call it quits for the day. All the people who are parked here are waiting to go to Skull Rock, which is right over there. Now Skull Rock is one of those other you must go to things. And in fact, I've seen tons of different photos of this, but it's not the only thing that's here. There's also something called Jumbo Rocks that's right in this area also. But today we're gonna go see the Skull Rock. Can you guys see it? There are two distinct sockets for an eye. And then down here is either like a nose or a mouth, but this is Skull Rock. And I would say it's probably pretty daunting if you discovered this for the first time and this was your landmark. Again, whenever we look at pioneers and even Native Americans, whenever they would come through an area, they would find very distinct looking things like this and that's how they would tell directions. So uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely could see that being a good place to kind of look to for reference. But yeah, it's just kind of menacing. But let me show you a little bit more. Now if we split off in the opposite direction of the Skull Rock, there's actually a Discovery Trail. And along the Discovery Trail, there are little signs like this. Signs like this completely line the trail so you can learn not only about the vegetation that you're seeing, but also the little critters in a little bit more detail. And I really like these because they are a nice height and also they are a metal sign so they don't get bleached out as much in the sun. So for years and years, these will actually be very good. And that is a big win in my book. Shorter trails like these are great because you can actually get out here and just stretch your legs a little bit and explore and see some of the natural beauty of the location and also learn about what is physically here. Now the map again is gonna give you the best information next to a visitor center, but next to that are the little signs that you'll find along the way. Plus you get to get really super close to the boulders and kind of see what makes Joshua Tree just such a unique place. And I love that, so yeah. This one's a big win. Definitely stop that you want to make. Oh, 
like a good challenge. So we're going to try to explore just a little bit more. And I'm hoping that through seeing some of these stops that it kind of piques your interest and kind of encourages you to come out and see Joshua Tree as well. Now there are so many other things that we're not going to be able to do today. However, a few more won't hurt anybody. So here we go. A few observations from driving. I know that now, next time I come into the park, I want to stay at White Tanks, Bell, or Jumbo Rocks Campground. And that is all that there is to it. You get to camp directly in the boulders. It's fabulous. And I drove down into one of them, not knowing that there was no parking for the public. And oh, wow, such a great campsite. So if you guys are looking for a paid site in park, check those three out. They are awesome. Every single one of them. Just so, so awesome. Now I did camp outside of the park at the Cottonwood area just before coming in and it was free camping. So that's also an option. But if you want something spectacular, those three are definitely it. I don't know how much that you can tell from the drive versus the beginning, but everything has completely changed. Like the vegetation no longer looks anything like it did before. This is insane how much of a difference that only about 10 miles has made. Okay, we're off to the Hall of Horrors and that sounds very troubling. <laughs> very troubling to say the least, but this is apparently where a lot of climbers come to do their thing. And I'm trying to see if I see anyone up on the walls, but from a distance, it's kind of hard. So we'll get a little bit closer and then find out. If not, we're just gonna have a really up close and personal view of the amazing rocks and the east side of the facing. Doesn't look like there's any climbers today as of this moment that we can see, but there are definitely some people like converging upon this point over here. So who knows? I have no idea. It's pretty windy. And most of the people that I know who climb don't tend to climb when it's this gusty, but you know, we can still have hopes and dreams and aspirations that we'll get to see something super cool, right? I think so. So I'm gonna keep my eyes open and uh, if I do see something, I'll show you guys. Otherwise, go check out my Garden of the Gods video if you wanna see some people going straight up. Just saying.
Well guys, that's it for Joshua Tree. I actually came into town to go ahead and get some gas and get ready for our next adventure. I hope you've enjoyed coming with me. The park was absolutely amazing and it's one I will definitely be circling back to so I can go on some of those hikes in the future. I hope that you will do the same and remember guys, we are not here for a long time but we are here for a good time. And if you're looking for one and happen to be in California, check out Joshua Tree. Till next time guys, bye!